Good morning, everybody. Good morning. In my experience, life has a funny knack of taking you to extraordinary places if you're brave enough to look for them. And my life really did follow that track in that I was the most unlikely person to sail around the world. I was a kid who grew up in Derbyshire, which in the United Kingdom is quite literally as far away from the sea as you can possibly get. And at the age of four, when I sailed for the first time, I set myself the goal that one day, somehow, I wanted to sail around the world. I had absolutely no idea how I'd achieve that, but I knew exactly where I was going. And although I didn't know the steps that I should take, I took what steps I could take. Tiny decisions in my life, such as saving school dinner money, reading everything about sailing, grasping any opportunity I could to spend more time on the water. And incredibly, just four years after leaving school, age 17, I was sitting in a boardroom in front of a man who I knew could make that dream come true. I was absolutely petrified. I knew that was the turning point of my life. And thankfully, he said yes. And that began the most incredible eight years of sponsorship, which enabled me to sail not once, but twice around the world, solo nonstop. The first in a race called the Vendee Globe, from France to France via Antarctica. And then the second was a much harder challenge. The second was to try to be the fastest person ever to sail solo nonstop around the world. And for this, you need quite a different boat. This is big and powerful, as you can see from the picture. And just to give us some scale, I could climb inside her mast all the way to the top. She was 75 foot long, 60 foot wide, and she was a multi-hull, which means she's light, she's fast, but she's dangerous. And just to give you an idea of what that danger can look like, that was a regular training sail off the French coast with a French friend. Now, this is a boat that clearly isn't doing what it's supposed to. There were 11 guys on that sailing it just off the French coast. They clearly did not intend to capsize, but it happens in literally seconds. And when you see the figures hanging onto the net, so high from the ocean, and you think about doing that on your own when you are two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town, it doesn't really bear thinking about. And it's something that I had personal experience of. Because just a couple of years before I set off to sail solo non-stop around the world on one of these things, I was racing in a training race with some French friends, and we did capsize. And it took five seconds from everything being fine. I was inside getting some food from the galley, about to go on watch. Five seconds later, we were thrown upside down, hurled across the cabin, and our world went black because the windows were forced underwater. And as an individual, it's the most scared I have ever been at sea, not for me, but for one of my friends, in fact, one of my best friends, who was trapped underneath the nets, which is submerged when the boats go upside down. And when you go and take on these journeys, you, you enter an entirely different world. You enter an entirely different thought process. You know, you're living on a boat which is racing through the seas, which could be two, three times the height of this room, 24-7. You can never, ever sleep saying, right now, I'm going to sleep for five minutes. Not even five minutes, because anything can happen at any time. So you generally sleep for five minutes, 10 minutes, sometimes 30, occasionally one hour, very rarely two hours, and only once in the three and a half months it took me to break that record did I sleep for three hours in a row. You really are living and breathing that journey and living at the pace of everything that's around you, the weather systems, the waves, the temperature, the icebergs. You're out there in the middle of nowhere. And to give you an idea of what nowhere feels like, if I needed help out there, it would take five days for a ship to get to me and then five days for that ship to get me back into a hospital or into a town. No plane can land out there and no helicopter can reach you. And in fact, the closest people to you, by a factor of five, are those manning the European space station up above you. So you really are in the middle of nowhere. And to enter that different world, you prepare in a different way. If I said to you all now, OK, go off, go off into the San Francisco area and find everything that you will need for your survival, everything, for the next three months. That's food, fuel, clothes, medical equipment, everything. Because there is no more. What you take is all you have. That's what we do. Yet we have to take the minimum, the absolute minimum, because there's no way you can break that record if the boat's too heavy. So you take that material with you, those resources with you, and from day one to day 71, you manage them. You see every drop of diesel going through the generator. You see every packet of food disappearing. And what that connected me to when I was never looking for it 
was the understanding of what finite really means. Because on that boat, what you have is all you have. There is no more. And I'd never, ever translated that to anything outside of racing. I thought I would be racing around the world until I was 100 years old. It's all I ever wanted to do. But suddenly, I connected to something, it's something much, much greater, how our global economy functions. And I couldn't get it out of my head, because our world, too, has finite resources, yet we're ripping through them in a way that cannot run in the long term. And so I set foot off that boat at the finish line, having broken the record, with an eye on the global economy and began a new journey of learning to understand how the global economy functions. I had no background in this whatsoever. So I started to speak, this is in 2006, 7, 8, to experts, scientists, uh, professors, economists, to understand how does the system within which we all live function. It's much, much broader, much, much wider, much more complex than that simple world that I lived at sea. And I realized it's not just the energy and the food that I had on board, the, the, the basic things, but it's also materials all the materials that make up our global economy. In 2008, I picked up the New Scientist report. How many years do we have left? And it talked of basic elements, things that we use in our economy every day. And you know, none of those figures will be exact of 40 years for tin and, silver, and uh, zinc, uh, 29 years for silver, even uranium, 59 years. None of those numbers are exact. We can't make them exact. They're, they're elements that are under the ground. But what we do know is they're finite. And yet the speed that we're using those resources up at is increasing. We have three billion new middle class consumers who are going to enter the global economy with demand for these resources that in the most part are finite. And what we saw back in those first years of learning is that, was, that, was that we'd seen a century of price declines in basic commodity prices erased in just 10 years. And that's because of the speed of the, of the use of those resources, the demand for those resources. And it wasn't just the fact that this decline had been erased, but it was also the volatility of the prices. Suddenly, we were seeing more volatility in raw material prices than we'd ever seen before in history. And to put this into context, you know, we work with companies all over the world, but one is car manufacturing and the industry. And between January 2011 and January 2012, the average European car manufacturer so a raw material price increase of over 550 million US dollars. That's half their operating profits wiped away through something they have no control over because their profit, their mechanism for making profit is to buy raw materials, to make vehicles, and then to sell them. To make more profit, they need to buy new raw materials, make more vehicles, and then sell them. That is the way they make money. And in a way, it's like a production line. It's like a conveyor belt. It needs items, materials to go in one end in order for things to come out the other end. And when I spoke to people in these early years of learning, you know, so much of the solution around this space was we need to be efficient. We need to make a vehicle more efficiently. We need to use less material as we make that vehicle. We need to lose, uh, use less energy as we build that vehicle. But when you pan that out and you look at the long-term consequences, yes, that's vital, absolutely vital to be careful with what we use because we only have so much, but that's useful in the transition to what? If we continue to do that for 10 years, does that mean we make no vehicles with no material, with no employment, with no business? What does the goal actually look like? And that's what fascinated me. Just as much as the, fa the, the goal of sailing around the world has fascinated me as a child, what did success look like? What did our economy look like when it really could function? And it, it struck me that the way our current economy works is predominantly linear. It's an economy where we take something out of the ground, we make something out of it, and then ultimately that product gets thrown away. Could I have the next slide, please? Sorry, my clicker's not working. <laughs> um, and even if we're efficient with the way that that economy functions, it doesn't solve the problem. It effectively buys us time. And as I said, what fascinated me was it bought us time in the transition to what? What actually functioned? Next slide, please. And then I met some people who saw the economy in a very different way. They saw the way things could work in a different way. One was a CEO from Holland. And he hadn't said to his workforce, we want to build the industrial carpet tiles that we make. That was his business more efficiently. But he said, we want to build them in a way that they're made to be made again. In fact, I don't really want to sell our carpet tiles. 
I'd rather lease them because I want to guarantee that we'll get them back because we're going to build a machine that can take that carpet tile, it can deconstruct it, melt it down, and turn it into the next carpet tile, repolymerize, depolymerizing and repolymerizing the yarn, and then taking the base and turning that into the base of the next carpet. An entirely different mod business model. His goal was to do that using entirely renewable energy by 2025. He wasn't thinking efficiency. He was thinking about a systemic change to his business that really could function in the long term. Next slide, please. And then that's a technical example. Industrial carpet tile, it's, it's a polymer, it's plastic, it's, it's, it's derived from oil. What about the biological elements? What about food waste, human waste? What about everything that biodegrades, cotton, timber? What about the value of that? How would that look like if we looked at that through a more circular lens, if we were able to recover that material, if we could get that material back to the farms? That doesn't happen today. For billions of years, that biological material has re-entered the earth, and actually we've broken that cycle. It doesn't happen. It goes off and it becomes waste. What if that could be valorized? What if we really could capture that value? Next slide, please. And that would be a circular economy, a different way of viewing the entire global economy. And the circular economy comes from many schools of thought that have existed for many years. Performance economy, sharing economy, biomimicry, cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, industrial symbiosis. All of this work, what if you could ca capture all of that and what if you could look at the entire economy through a lens, a circular lens, whereby you would keep products, components, and the materials within them at their highest value and utility at all times? What would that actually look like? And there's none of the economy that that doesn't incorporate, because it's energy, it's materials, it's everything that throws, flows through the economy. It's education, it's the way young people learn. How do we see the economy functioning in the future? How could this work? It really fascinated me as an individual, Suddenly, I could see things differently. Everything I saw, I saw differently. And it opened up a whole different concept of what the world could look like. Now, when we look at, next slide, please. When we look at this photo, we see waste. But that all should have value. But we've not built the economy in a way that can capture that. This is a, a symptom of a system that doesn't work. That guy there is pulling out plastic drinking straws of a certain type because he knows they have value. All that should have value. The system that we've built can't function in the long term. The system has some flaws in it. And it was that systemic change that fascinated us when we launched the Ellen MacArthur Foundation just under five years ago, with the goal to accelerate the transition to a circular economy, to work with businesses, to work on policy, to work in education, to look at communicating this idea, and very importantly, to create analysis and insight as to what this could really look like when we dug into the details, to really get an understanding of a circular economy. And when we put this, this, these first ideas on paper and we started to break down what a circular economy really looked like, it was fascinating. And I'll go back to that line of keeping products, components, and the materials within them at their highest value and utility at all times. On the right-hand side there, you see the technosphere, metals, plastics, things that don't biodegrade, materials that you would want to keep flowing through the economy for as long as possible. On the left-hand side, you have biological materials, so wood, cotton, timber, food waste, human waste, agricultural waste, things that biodegrade and you, and you would want to re-enter the biosphere. And what we found was, you know, those images I just showed you, whereby that waste should have value, that the smaller items, that's the outer loop on the right-hand side. That's effectively what we have as recycling today. And what we do today is we get what we can out of the system. We take that big collection of waste and we say, what can we derive that has value out of that? A broken washing machine, what can we derive that has value out of that? Rather than going to the beginning and saying, how do we build an economy where everything that comes out of the end has value? And we found those outer loops, the recycling that we, could, that we have today and we could build towards higher levels of in the materials, the pure materials themselves, that has value, yes, absolutely. But so much more value lies on the inner loops. So not just the material themselves, but the remanufacturing, the parts, the equipment, the reselling, remanufacturing, so shifting towards once you've built something, keeping that product active for as long as possible, keeping the value in it for as long as possible. And it's not to say that when technology moves on, we can't change products. Absolutely, we will. We have done. But it's about valorizing what we have for longer. And it's about building it in a way whereby when technology moves on, we can still recover the components and the materials and feed them back into the economy, which isn't how things work today. And in order to build this picture, one of the first things that we did was we went to McKinsey. 
We went with our global partners at the time, the companies that helped found the foundation from a funding perspective, and we said, what could this circular economy look like if we dig into more detail? And we've produced, in conjunction with McKinsey, three economic reports. The first one was based on medium complexity goods, so medium term goods, goods that cycle in more than one year and less than 10, and that was a Europe European study. The second report we looked at faster moving consumer goods. What was a global, uh, what was what the value of a global opportunity in this space could look like. And then the third report led to a pr project that we ran in conjunction with the World Economic Forum, which has led to two initial projects, one looking at asset tracking, and now asset tracking can enable a circular economy. And the second is looking at how we can build an economy whereby plastic packaging never becomes waste, but re-enters the economy as a valuable and defined biological or technical nutrient. And with that, we're working with 14 global CEOs, really trying to set what those parameters can look like so we can get the majority of the market to shift towards that model. But just on those first two reports, I'd like to dig in to a couple of things. The first one, we took five products in this European study for medium complex goods. We took mobile phone, smartphone, light commercial vehicle, washing machine, and cotton as a material. And we wanted to know what the value of this could look like. We didn't even know if it had value. We didn't even know if shifting towards circular models would deliver more value for the economy. The answer was yes, it did. It was profitable for business. It was much better for the wider economy. We felt it would increase employment, but we also felt that it was able to decouple growth from resource constraints. And I'll just dig into one example, the washing machine. We looked at today's washing machines, which you know, if you're in the UK, most people buy a low-end machine designed to do about 2,000 washes. You pay tax when you buy it, you own the machine, you own all of the materials in the machine, every bit you own, they're yours. Yet when that machine breaks, we don't take it apart, recover the materials and stock them in our garage. We don't want it. We want the functionality. If you look at the high-end machines, which cost significantly more to buy, which most people don't have, they're designed for much longer, they're designed to be repaired, they're designed in part to be remanufactured. It's a different system, but it costs you a lot more to buy that machine, so most people don't. The fact is that that low-end machine that most people buy costs you 27 cents a wash, and the high-end machine costs you just 12 cents a wash, but most people don't have that. If you switch to more circular models, we wouldn't buy that machine. We wouldn't own all the materials in that machine when we needed to wash clothes at home. We would pay per wash. The manufacturers would buy the materials, they'd build the machines, we would have access to those machines. They would make sure they get delivered, maintained, repaired, remanufactured. When a new and better, more energy efficient machine comes out, we would have access to that as part of the contract. But then that old machine would go back into the system and the materials be recovered because those manufacturers know every single material in that machine and the value of it. Suddenly we win because we get access to 12 cents a wash and the manufacturers win because they get access to those materials and they provide us with a better service and a better machine. So the stats were fascinating. The second report was faster moving consumer goods, a 3.2 trillion US dollar market, yet currently we only recover 20% of it by value. 68 billion US dollars of textiles are lost within the global economy every year because we don't track them, we don't have an ability to keep their value at its highest. We looked at what was the value of a ton of food waste if we could valorize it to its highest level. $6 of fertilizer, $18 of heat, and $26 of electricity in every single ton. Currently, that rarely happens. And I'd like to move on to a few case studies because I've talked about stats and numbers, but actually some case studies of what a circular economy really looks like, case studies of what's out there in the global marketplace today. Renault, we work with Renault, they have a plant that remanufactures engines. They take broken engines, gearboxes, and fuel pumps from right across the European Renault network. They arrive rusty in a pallet. They go into the factory, they get disassembled, ultrasonically cleaned, reassembled in the most part of parts that have been in engines before, then tested to the highest level. They're tested to the same level as a brand new Renault engine. And then they leave that factory in a box saying, genuine Renault parts. They're real parts. Those engines won't last forever, but they're getting so much more value out of those engines. We get that engine with the same warranty as a new one for less. They make more money because they already own the materials. And what's fascinating is when you see that systemic shift, the shift in keeping that engine at its highest value, the energy, the embedded energy and materials in that remanufactured engine are 80% less than a new one. So it enables a shift when you start remanufacturing and you you, you maintain the, the value and utility of these products. 
Once you start to do that, the energy requirements come down because you're not pumping those new raw materials through the system all the time. Renault also has a fleet of electric vehicles. In this case, they've changed the business model whereby when you buy those cars, you don't buy the battery, but you're guaranteed the battery gets swapped out every time it gets to 75% of capacity. Therefore, you always have a top functioning battery and they get the materials, they get the lithium in that battery back. Now, that's just a battery, not the entire vehicle, but it shows a shift in business model is a very important element of a circular economy. You'll see recurrent in the case studies. Uh, Michelin, if you're a truck um, haulage company in the US, you probably don't buy your tires or own them, but you have a contract with Michelin whereby you pay per mile. They build the best tires because they want them to last as long as possible, and they take them back and they remanufacture them into tires that are able to go and run on the road again. It incentivizes different behavior, different design, and it incentivizes different financial models. Rolls-Royce, powered by the hour. You know, most of the engines that fly with uh, Rolls, sorry, most of the planes that fly, they don't actually own their engines, but they pay per hour of airtime. So the manufacturers who understand those engines to the tiniest detail build the best engine, they repair it, they remanufacture it, they understand when parts need changing out, and arguably one of the, the items that we need, we really need to work. We really need to be at its highest value at all times. But they've shifted that business model. That's been in place for years now, and that's a business model that really works. You know, some of these engines were built in the 1970s, but they're absolutely 100% functionality because every part is changed when it needs to be. Turd 2 in the Netherlands had a project with Philips, another of our partners, whereby if you're an office, um, or you're a company that needs offices, in fact, rather than actually going into an office space, buying all the lights, uh, buying all the equipment, you would have a contract where that was provided to you, a little bit like the pay per mile. So rather than buying the lights, Philips would provide the lighting. You would pay for 400 lumens at desk height. They would provide the lighting. They would pay the electricity. When more efficient technology comes along, they will change it out because it's in their interest because they pay the electricity bill. And when that lighting goes back into their manufacturing plant, they know exactly what's in it. They know the materials. They can recover them in time as the design principles change to enable that, those materials to feed into the lights of the future. The whole system changes. Mazuma Mobile started buying our old mobile phones. You know, all of us have phones in our desks or in our cupboards at home, phones that we don't use any longer. They realized these had real value. They started buying them back, millions of them. And yet, then the service providers realized that they were giving us phones as part of a contract, and they were missing out on some of this value. So they then started changing their tariffs, whereby you could have a better tariff, you would pay less for your phone, for a better phone that would get changed every single year, guaranteed as part of the contract, a performance contract in effect, which means we get the best phone for less money, but when the next iPhone comes out, our previous iPhone goes back into the manufacturer, back into the service provider to be resold, remanufactured, whatever. But that cycle is complete, whereby that phone goes back in to be valorized. Technology that enables components and circuit boards to be disassembled. So first stage, components taken off circuit boards, but then the circuit boards to be melted down and the raw materials taken out. This technology exists today, enabling us to recover more materials from these items. Technology innovations whereby a, a bolt put in a fluid at a certain temperature, the thread strips away and you can disassemble things more easily so that you can remanufacture them. Products such as um, fabrics that are, that are made in a way by, whereby the fabric has no non-toxic dyes in it, sorry, no toxic dyes in it whatsoever. The factory that makes those fabrics sends out cleaner water than it takes in from the river next, next to it. And those fabrics themselves, you could eat them. They're totally non-toxic, biodegradable. They have no uh, waste costs because all the excess material from that factory gets sent to farmers to put on farmland to protect their crops as they grow and they just disappear into the soil. Absolutely sitting within the biosphere. That company now has a significant proportion of all the fabrics it makes sitting in that bracket. It doesn't need to advertise it, but it just built it as a better model for building those fabrics. Companies like Ecovative here in the US, whereby they've challenge the system to, to design a new form of styrofoam, which is non-toxic biodegradable. Wherever that ends up, it will never be waste. If it ends up in a farmer's field, it will never be waste because it's built out of mycelium. So out of food waste, the, the grainy, the, the fibrous part of food waste and farming waste, they grow mycelium. So it's mushrooms, effectively, that turn into that packaging. Expanding business, extraordinary person behind that, but rethinking that system. Puma with its plastic bags, they're not plastic. They're built out of a cornstarch that when you put in water, it biodegrades. You can swirl it around, it disappears, you can take it down the toilet. 
it never becomes waste because it's designed for the biosphere, designed to fit within a system. Splosh, cleaning products. Rather than us go to the supermarket or the hypermarket or the mall, as you have here, and buy cleaning products, they will send them to your house. So they send bottles. They also send the replacements that sit within the bottles. The replacement, you can see the little slug in there, drops into the bottle. You put warm water in the bottle, the slug drops in, the outer case of the slug dissolves, the fluid within it then turns into the cleaning product because it's highly concentrated. That product is designed to be biodegradable and non-toxic. You clean your house with it, it goes down the system, down the sewage system, it will never become waste. It's designed to fit within the biocycle. And I guess just to finish, what the most inspirational thing for me about the circular economy is, it, it's about opportunity. When we first put the foundation together and we started to communicate the circular economy, we had no idea what the real economic opportunity was. But there is massive economic opportunity in shifting to this model. We showed that with the McKinsey reports time and time again. If we can shift to be a, a circular rather than a linear company, we can deliver more value. We can keep those products, components, and the materials within them, be that a hotel or an iPhone. Keep that at its highest value and utility at all times. It makes absolute sense. We've built those things. We have that infrastructure. We have IT now to enable this to happen. We can asset track. We can tag things. We know where things are. We know what state they're in. Now is the time, more than ever before, for a circular economy to happen. And it really is based on opportunity. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks, Ellen. Wow, your uh, focus and dedication are so compelling in those slides in your, in your presentation. Um, before we start talking about the circular economy, I thought just, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions just on the sailing because I know this is on everyone's mind, if you don't mind, because obviously it lays the foundation of it. But you know, most of us would be whining terribly if we didn't have seven hours of sleep. So how is it possible you maintain your presence and focus with so, so little uh, sleep and ability to manage that? It's incredible, and that, that must go through. Are you still sleeping just one hour at a time, or now are you back on a, you actually well, do? Well, having, having just done a transatlantic flight, you, you, I slept less last night than, no, than you, I would otherwise have done. You're perfect for global travel. Actually, you're the perfect <laughs> traveler, exactly. But how, it doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> how do you not become a babbling idiot on the boat by, by sleeping so little? I mean, I, it's, I guess it, it's hard to describe, but I think all of us, when put in a certain situation, you know, everyone has hard times in life. We all have times yeah. that are difficult. Um, and we deal with those in a certain way. You know, when you can't get much sleep because you've got something important at work, or you have someone sick at home, or your kids are sick, you have to deal with it. You know, you're up with them half the night, you're worried about them. It's, this is real stuff. We all click into a mode when we have to deal with something. And I guess when you race around the world, you do just that. Did you train for that aspect of it, the psychological aspects of the trip? Or is you just training for the mechanical skills of sailing? Um, you have to train for so much. So you have All, to train the to whole. The, the whole big picture. So you have yeah. to train to, um, you don't really train to sleep as such. So you know, every night before you go, you don't keep waking yourself up. Some people do, I, I don't believe in that. I try and bank sleep before I go. But training for me was to be, be, be at sea as much as possible. So I would be at sea for six months of every year. Uh, before both around the world, I sailed halfway around the world in training, the most part on my own. So I could understand the boat in the Southern Ocean. I could be on the boat, not with the pressure of the race, but just understand how it functions, drive it to its best potential, and, and get used to that rhythm. So I think that's, wow. that's one element that you, you work really hard at. But at the same time, you have to train to repair yourself medically. You have to inject yourself in your, you know, your leg to know that you can do it because no one can administer drugs when you're out there if you need painkillers or antibiotics. Yep. So you have to train you know, what everything in the medical cabinet does. Um, so there's a lot of different elements. But I guess once you set off on that journey, you click into that mode and that's how you, you cope. You're, you so want to get to the finish line. That, mm, you, you, that overtakes you, the, it, the it other It overtakes issue. everything. You, you deal yeah. with it. But you know, I wanted to do that all my life. No matter how hard it was, it was my choice. And I can't say it was easy because it really wasn't but it's your choice and you, you just click into that. Wonderful, incredible. I, I can see how that builds the rigor in your life and how you approach issues like this. Now, just one other issue. I've seen every movie on boat survival in the ocean and there's always a shark villain in the movie. You did not, <laughs> you did not mention, uh, is it like Unbroken where we're surrounded by sharks or do the sharks become your friends or uh, how does that work? I, What's the um, relationship part of that? It's, so I, I think only, I've only ever seen two sharks ever when I've been at sea. Get out. 
You don't see, <laughs> you don't see sh sharks are what you see when you're, in the co you're near the coast. You know, when you sail around the world, yes. uh, the way I have, when it's non-stop, you generally, in a normal circumnavigation that's non-stop around the world, you won't see land at all. <laughs> so you're not sailing down the coast, you know, watching the surfers and looking out for the shark fins. You, you know, you're, you're in the middle of nowhere, so you don't really see them. But you do see whales, and yeah. you do see dolphins, although the second time the boat was so fast, the dolphins couldn't be bothered to play. So I didn't really see dolphins That's, apart from at the well, start. Well, they're, they're happy fish. And, and seabirds. You see the most amazing birds in the Southern Ocean. When you're racing around Antarctica, the wandering albatross live down there. And they have uh, a wingspan. I mean, this is one yeah. wing of a wandering al albatross. Yep, yep. They're half the width of this stage, and they, they fly behind you for days. They're absolutely amazing. So, Wonderful. yeah, not quite the, uh, not quite the jaws, it's though. <laughs> <laughs> we're going um, to take questions from you, and, and I'm gonna, we're going to chat here for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll, we'll turn to you. We've got people in the audience. Uh, uh, two of our uh, series staff have microphones, so we'll come to you. It's going to be kind of hard for us to see you back there, but they'll catch you in a few minutes. So why don't we just chat for a little bit and set this up a little bit more. Um, you did a wonderful job of kind of linking the resource scarcity issues that you confront while out there sailing on the race around the world with how that guided your thinking now into the business side. Um, but talk a little bit more about you and how you made the, going from champion world-class sailor to um, starting a foundation to driving business change. Now that's, that's, a, that's a different dimension of skill. Um, can you link that for us? Because everybody here, I would argue, in the 600-person audience is a change agent of sorts. Mm -hmm. And how did, you, how did you make that transition? I guess this You didn't come out of a, a strong business environment, it doesn't sound like. Not you, at you're, all. You came in, you're an athlete. Mm. I'd, I had some business experience. I say business experience, not, not in the way that yeah. you would within a company, but because I'd always worked with sponsors, mm -hmm. I had spoken at conferences, and I, you know, I had general... Um, knowledge of what happens at these conferences, the, the general level of conversation at the conferences. You know, mm -hmm. I worked with business people, so I wasn't entirely away from that space, but I was no expert in this field. And I guess for me, that personal journey was, first of all, realizing there was something else outside that wasn't sailing, mm -hmm. because for years there was nothing other right. than sailing. I so thought long. I'd be doing that forever. Yeah. That was the first realization. Actually, then there was almost a, a, a very challenging phase of the realization that I was going to walk away from sailing, which was my comfort zone, which I had absolutely no will to walk away from. I have never and will never ever have had enough of sailing. It wasn't <laughs> like I you know, said, okay, that's it. I've been around the world twice. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go and find something else to do at all. Yeah. So the hardest decision I've ever made in my life was stepping away from sailing to do something that I had no track record or background in. So I was really starting from zero. Mm. But I guess the biggest motivation for me was, was to, to find, and I mentioned it in the, in the speech, is to find that same feeling I'd had as a kid. I'd... I'd I'd understood something didn't quite feel right in the global economy, that something didn't really work. I, I didn't even know what that was to begin with. And the more I learned, the more I realized that I couldn't put my finger on what success looked like. And actually, just using less wasn't, wasn't the goal that was going to get us to, to, to jump over the hurdle. Actually, it was about you know, what does success really look like. And what's been amazing on the journey is that you know, initially something that you, you've, you, you know, we'll have all have been on this journey, you, you first discover this and you think, crikey, actually this is not something you know, as a child I thought about, or maybe some of you did, but, but I was focused on sailing. And the more you learn, the more you want to try and work out what success looks like. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, it's quite, um, it's quite frightening because you, you can't see that. Yeah. It's all about buying ourselves more time. It's all about we yeah. mustn't do this and we mustn't do this. And specifically in, in education, you know, we work with education at the foundation, young people, pfft, you know, they'd almost had enough. They were, well, what can I do then? Because if I can't do this and I can't do this, and in fact, the less I do, the better. Actually, they, they would get so disheartened, yet with mm. circular economy, everything is there to be redesigned. Everything is, everything is out there for the taking. Mm. And with the, the economic rationale that we've discovered through working with McKinsey and our partners, suddenly this is, this is all about opportunity. And that, for me, is, puts me in the same zone mentally as racing around the world. That was an opportunity. It was a challenge, a massive challenge, mm -hmm. but it was a huge opportunity, and this is absolutely the same. But, but how did you get a, a company like Renault that you just talked about? Um, we all work with companies, and um, it's hard sometimes getting inside the power structure and getting the right people to listen to your story and listen to what you're saying. Why, did, why do these companies open their door to your voice and, and you make that connection? How do you do that? I think initially in, in the investigative phases before we even launched the foundation, um, we talked to a lot of people, and a lot of those were CEOs. And because of the experiences that I'd had at sea, you know, I, I, I happened to have a name which I wasn't looking for. I was given right. the, you know, the, the, the title Dame Ellen MacArthur. That helped to open doors, and I'm being very honest, it did. <laughs> 
Um, you know, we didn't have all the answers at all in that phase. You know, we, we still don't have all the answers, but it was, a, it was a learning phase. And when you talk to those guys, this was real. Yeah. It was real. This was real, you know, bottom line. I mentioned the European car manufacturer example. It was real. Yeah. You know, the current operating model cannot run in the long term. They absolutely, they were the first to know that. They needed to look for alternatives, how to deliver more value, how to, you know, how to create more profit, how to become more resilient as an organization, how to become more investable so they're not exposed to you know, price volatility. That was, you know, you could sit with a CEO and look him in the eyes or, or her in the eyes and you could absolutely have that conversation. That was a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. We didn't then know the economics and it was their belief in maybe there's, the, you know, that maybe there's something in this circular economy, maybe actually if we can valorize things to a high level. And what we found was in the case of, you know, Philips was already remanufacturing healthcare, absolutely yep. circular economics. You know, all the pieces of the puzzle aren't there, but that's their goal and they're working towards that. Renault already had remanufacturing. These were parts of the business, they're not new. Remanufacturing in Renault's existed for, for decades, but suddenly it starts mm. to fit into a bigger piece of the picture. So it was really that dialogue that, that, let, that helped us to learn more about circular economics through the through statistics, through what's actually happening, and then build that rapport. And, and, it, and it makes sense. It makes fundamental sense. Those are great examples that you showed us. Uh, tell us, though, on, on a continuum of where they are as some of the businesses you're working with. Um, how close are they to your vision of a circular business of, as a system? Or is it, is it first experimenting with product lines and trying to get that um, as you gave those couple examples, or is there a systemic approach that you think is starting to reside in these businesses? There's definitely a systemic approach. In fact, you can't become circular through uh, siloed activity. It's not possible. Um, it's about changing everything from design to manufacturing to how you sell the product to how you recover the product. You know, what are the incentives for your salespeople? Is it to sell kit or is it to provide performance? Is it to provide um, a, a service to remanufacture that? Or, you know, there's some pretty big shifts that happen within the finance department, the marketing mm -hmm. department, ev everything, the, the entire way the company shifts. So I'd say all the companies we're working with are beginning to move towards that systemic change. I think there isn't one that would say they're even 10% of the way on the journey, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a, it's a long journey, but it's about knowing where you're trying to get to. And I think traditionally there have been many different um, uh, projects going on within companies that have been disconnected and actually what mm -hmm. we find with circular economy is the CEO can stand on the stage and say this is where we're going and this involves you, 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 this delivers more value, this is where the company is going and that's been very powerful. Yeah, you know, I'd encourage you to look at her website um, after our, uh, not during, but after our presentation and look at the companies that are part of the, uh, I think you call it the circular 100 is, mm -hmm. is afraid, because the diversity of the companies is quite interesting. So I want to ask you about one in particular that caught my attention because we talked about products here a lot and what we're doing, but you have the Scottish government. Mm -hmm. The Scottish government is one of your, how do, and, and, and we all know government actually represents a significant part of the economy. How does a government fit into this model? That's an interesting question. Actually, when we first created the foundation, we set out to work with business, we set out to work with education, and we set out to work on analysis and insight and the communication. Uh, we hadn't specifically said we're going to go to government, but that mm -hmm. happened after two years. Um, through an event we ran with McKinsey in Germany. We had a representative from the European Commission who came along, fascinated by the concepts of a circular economy because we believed it created more employment, it mm -hmm. created more resilience, not just for a company but for a, for a region because you're able to use the resources much more intensively within a certain area. So we then start, started having uh, regions, cities, governments coming to us, not just the European Commission, which has led to ongoing work with them, and they've actually created the circular economy package, which is being reviewed to come out at the end of this year. But also regions saying, we, we love this idea. We can see this will bring more value to our region. It will help our small to medium enterprises in our region. Big push on small to medium enterprises. Mm. And so as we built the circular economy 100, and we started two years ago to build a, a platform, an acceleration platform to, to help companies to understand circular economy to a greater extent, to try and help build collaborations between different companies, organizations, uh, we built not only the companies themselves, the big corporates, but we also mm. put in there emerging innovators, mm. uh, many here from the US, small companies with incredible ideas that, that really have potential to go to scale and, and in a way um, disrupt the system. Also in there are universities we work with through our education program, but the, the fourth part of that circular economy 100 is the cities and regions I because see. there's such demand right. for the ability for small to medium enterprises to do more of the circular activity in the regions, but also demand for the regions to help that to happen. Right. So they're fascinated in what policy levers 
will help to accelerate circular economy activity. And actually, you know, a city has a fair amount of, um, of ability to change the rules or yep. play with the rules. Yep. And, that, and that's quite an, an interesting concept for us. Uh, let me ask one more question, and then we'll turn to the audience if I could. You know, one thing we often get hung up here in our own strategies is on um, the chicken and the egg around public policy mm -hmm. and how it affects the transition mm -hmm. to a um, low carbon economy. Mm -hmm. um, some of our actions seem dependent upon policy changes yep. and how much can we do with or without government policy changes. For your, your sense of what you are doing, mm -hmm. how relevant is policy to that? Um, it's an accelerator, but it's not essential. Okay. Uh, one of the questions we asked McKinsey when we produced that first report was, um, was to what extent will policy play a part in this? And when we looked at the top line figure, the first report was 630 billion US dollars, the second report was 706 billion US dollars, and the third report was over a trillion. That mm. first report looking at Europe, the first 360 billion US dollars of the 630 total was without any changes in government legislation or taxation. So that's there now for the taking. So companies don't need this to shift towards more circular models, but if legislation shifts and helps to incentivize this, it's, it will accelerate it, but it's not necessary. Great, you're wonderful. Let me uh, turn to the audience then. We'll, we'll take about uh, 15 minutes, it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. You've got that managed out there? It's really hard to see you all. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you've. Uh, could you introduce yourself for us? Oh, uh, so Martin knows. Wilhelm, uh, Geopolis Energy Partners. Um, you, you've made the point that um, IT is, is a big enabler in the uh, transition to a circular economy. Um, now, IT is, is a, in many ways a relatively mature technology. How about some, some less mature areas of science and technologies like mm. uh, molecular engineering, yeah. Uh, yeah. biotech, um, nanotechnologies? How crucial have you found those areas to be to, to push the, uh, the limit of how mm -hmm. far you can go with the circular? I'd say that those technologies are, are essential to accelerate that transition. Not to take the first steps, um, but when you look at completing the picture, you need to be able to build products so you can recover materials. We find, you know, with the work that we do with education and the, with the universities, young people absolutely get this. So material science is amazing because it, it, you know, what question do you ask when you start that process of designing something? And at the moment, we just design an X, but actually within a circular economy, you design it in a certain way for disassembly, you can recover the materials, you can remanufacture, you would use different materials. That's hugely exciting uh, for that space, but not just within education, also within the companies we work with. You know, they all have their own research departments and they, they look at the, you know, they have their own scientists and they look at materials, uh, collaborate with other organizations on materials. So it's a huge space, but I think, there's lots of elements to the circular economy. There's kind of ideal scenario we'd love to get to whereby everything's designed for disassembly and the materials are recoverable and everything feeds back into the system. Obviously, that's, that's the goal. Um, and doing that with a shift to renewables at the same time because the threshold energy levels come down because you're remanufacturing, that's, that's kind of where we'd love to be. But actually, even in the, the cell phone example is a great one in that by changing the system whereby you, you effectively have a performance model and you get that handset you know, and it gets refreshed every year, once you've shifted to that model, that handset goes back to the people who know what to do with it, rather than it sitting in our drawer. That's kind of level one. So that's, you don't have to get the, all of that technology in place to, to kick it all off. So you, you, know, you, you can start tomorrow, effectively, but when you start to, move, start to move towards more and more circular, that's when all of those parts come into play. And, and many companies are doing that now. You know, Climatex, the, the company that I showed, the fabric company, they're doing that now. They've been doing it for years, and, and they started off saying, right, of the, I think it was the hundreds of dyes that were available, which ones are non-toxic? And I think they came up with, was it seven or 14? It was a very small number, but with those dyes, they could create every color they needed. And so suddenly, they were able to say, right, by asking the right question of this is what we want to, we want to use dyes from this section, then we can shift the whole business model. So a lot of it's underway already, but it's, it's a huge area for innovation. What are some of the pushbacks, though, you get in these conversations? It can't all be as sensible as this, this creates efficiency and better cost and everything. There must be a give and take around some of these conversations. What, what is the other side of that? I'd, I'd the, say, yeah. the plastic bag mm -hmm. example you gave was mm -hmm. amazing. We're in this mm -hmm. endless plastic bag debate in mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. And I, when I see that, I said, well, gosh, why don't we do that tomorrow? What's, what's, there must be. I think part of it's linear lock-in. Linear. Oh. We'd, we'd call it linear lock-in. Yeah. You know, we've, we've, we've 
when you look at you know look at the US, look at the UK, look at you know Europe, we've we've been through the industrial revolution. We've done amazing things, you know, things that we never believed possible a hundred years ago. We've done things that were, were, were impossible, but we've done that through that, that linear economy which relies on cheap energy and cheap fossil fuels. And actually that's mm -hmm. beginning to change. It's not changed overnight, but it's, it's, it's absolutely shifting. So we're beginning to look for other models. So it's easy to criticize the linear economy, but actually, you know, we, I don't think anyone said one day, right, we're gonna build this really bad linear economy. Actually, we built it and it, and it worked really well, but actually there's much and much more demand for those materials and there may be a better way of doing things. I, I think, so, so, you, so, so that linear economy thinking is there. It's within businesses, it's within, um, even when you look at, you know, MBAs, yep. you know, much of what you learn is linear, it's not yep. circular. So it's actually just there in the thinking. So I think breaking out of that linear thinking and seeing the, the circular opportunity, mm -hmm. it's actually, it takes a while. You know, it's, for us, it takes a while. You know, we're learning more all the time and you, you need to break it down so you see everything through this different lens. I'd say that that's one of the hurdles is, is actually taking a step back and looking at the opportunity and then making it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, none of us are sitting here saying this is easy, but what we've shown is we believe there's a lot more value to be had through accessing these models, which involve structural change. They involve systemic yeah. changes in the business. Absolutely. You know, that takes time. It takes time to work out how to incentivize people within the business to do the right thing. And then it's not just the CEO, it's not just the bottom of the business, but it's the managers as well, because they're trying to, you know, get their figures at the end of every quarter or every month or mm -hmm. every week. And actually, what are they incentivized to do? So actually working that out is, is not necessarily easy, but when there's more value to be had through these models, it's, it's well worth going for. Fabulous. Or right over here, we yeah. You. Is this one? Yeah, uh, Peter Joseph with Citizens Climate Lobby. Very interesting talk and efforts that you're making. And my question is, how would your entire program be impacted if there were reasonable and intelligent pricing of carbon emissions that are currently essentially for free? One of the things we talk about a lot at the foundation within circular economy is prices must tell the full truth, which you can read in many ways. You can read that about raw materials. You can read that about carbon. Um, this, you know, I think we all appreciate that the system within which we live at the moment has kind of reached a, a question point, and we need to look at how we shift to different models. So I'd say prices should tell the full truth. That would include the pricing of, of everything that exists within the materials flow. You know, CO2 is a material. We have an excess of it. There's lots of it, a bit too much of it. It'd be great if we could feed some of that back into the system through reprocessing it through technology uh, or otherwise. But, but yes, prices must tell the full truth. And actually, for a long time, they haven't. Thank you. Uh, it looks like in the back left there, I see a hand. Do you have a microphone back there? I've got oh, just whilst we're waiting, I should also mention oh. we're, we're currently We'll start over here. Sorry, there, there's a microphone right over here. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Hi, Dave, Dave Mellon over here on your right. Okay. Uh, Joel McCower from GreenBiz. Um, first of all, thank you for the energy and, and incredible thought leadership you're bringing to this. It really is a gift to the work that everyone in this room does. As I've talked to people about the circular economy, to companies, which I've been doing a lot lately, thanks in large part to the conversation you've catalyzed, they think, as I do, that this is the right idea at the right time, but there's also a lot of skepticism born out of a, sort of a been there, done that uh, interface, tried the carpet tile leasing, mm -hmm. Electrolux did the washing machine per wash uh, model, uh, Procter & Gamble and, and Clorox and others did the yeah. refillable you know, uh, bottles, cl uh, cleaners, and none of them are doing that anymore, it didn't work. How do you explain to companies that are enthusiastic about this that somehow this time it's different? I, th I, th mm. I think there's the several elements to that. What, one is that you know, many of the examples that I put on the screen of circular economics that are existing today really do work and are accelerating. And if you take you know, Philips and their remanufacturing of healthcare equipment and lighting, that's absolutely an expanding sector of that business. So it's not... That, there are examples that were tried many years ago that maybe haven't taken off, but there are also many examples that really have. The second part is I think when we're talking about systemic change, I think there are some real challenges of one business doing this on their own. And, and I can, if I take Project Mainstream, the project that we're running in conjunction with the World Economic Forum, with analysis by McKinsey, looking at you know, global plastics packaging and the roadmap and what does the, you know, what does the plastics future look like, um, 
that's inc you know, if one company changed everything tomorrow, that wouldn't solve the problem. It needs agreement on systemic change as to what does that palette of materials look like that can be valorized, either technical or biological. So actually getting everybody around the table to say, this is where we're trying to go. And the World Economic Forum is absolutely a, 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 it's a superb platform for that because it convenes uh, businesses at the highest level. Getting that agreement for some of those challenges will make a difference. Because, and we see this with the Circular Economy 100. You know, we bring together businesses from all over the world. They can try and do this on their own, but actually when you sit everybody in a room and everyone agrees they're trying to work towards this and there are collaborations to be made through, it could be a common material, it could be a different business model, it could be one business working with another, offering them a service from their business and that business understanding why they're trying to do that, therefore they collaborate and, and expand that part of the business. There's many reasons why working together is important. So I'd say well, that there are kind of two answers to your question. And, and then the third part is, I think now with the IT that we have, you know, 10 years ago, the IT we had was nowhere near what we have today. You know, Cisco is one of our partners. We're working on asset tracking with them, looking at how you track products, how you track materials, how do you know when a certain part in your washing machine needs changing out? How do you know when there's a certain part in an iPhone needs changing out? Is it a vehicle? Is it heavy machinery? You know, the ability to be able to track things with these billions of new IP addresses that we now have, um, that's a massive asset to the circular economy. And, and I think that, you know, the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, really is an enabler of that. So I, I kind of feel the time is now a little bit as well. And, and you know, as I said in the, in the presentation, circular economy, in a way, it's, it's not new. It's, what we've tried to do is take all of these ideas that have existed, awesome ideas where phenomenal work's been done and said, you know, if we shift, if we shift from linear to circular, we, we pull these ideas together and give them economic rationale, what's it worth to the global economy as, as a, you know, a systemic shift. And, and I do feel there's... there's significant energy in that right now. Great. We're, we're actually right at the end of our time. Maybe just in closing, um, Ellen, you could, uh, going back to the fact that we have our change agents here from a lot of different angles. We've got a lot of people from NGOs here that are constantly looking at advocacy issues. We've got large investors, and then we've got people that work at the Fortune 500 themselves. What, what, what would you leave them? What, what can they do? What, what action steps could they take to be more effective in this area? That's an interesting one. Well, actually, we've produced, if anyone wants to learn more, we've just hot off the press is a book on the Super. circular economy produced by the foundation, written by a head of innovation, Ken Webster, um, to learn, because the circular economy is not something you kind of, from one day to the next, you think, yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. You know, mm -hmm. I still don't totally understand it, and we've been working on this for five years. So understanding what it can be and what elements that, it, um, that, that are necessary to work towards it, I think that's, that's one important phase. It's a bit like you know, linear from circular, it involves breaking down many barriers. Some of those are in our brains. So I'd say just trying to understand what circular economy is in depth is something very useful, and, you know, we're all in the process of doing that. And I think, you know, just take one element, investors and, and businesses. You know, when you think about a circular economy, it's a more resilient, restorative economy. It's mm -hmm. an economy whereby take, you know, the biological, the, you know, the biosphere and biological materials, it can be restorative. Actually, if you can collect farm waste, agricultural waste, human waste, and get it back onto the farms, you are regenerating yep. farmland. Yep. That has a value. I think 40, is it, I can't remember the figures now, 40 billion is lost every year in the value of farmland because it's degrading and the, you know, the materials are washing, you know, the, the, the nutrients are washing into the sea. So there's actually, there's an ability to be restorative. That has a value, and that has a value in theory, in, in, you know, in investment. There's a, there's a bigger picture financial element to this. And then the second would be if you just take two businesses uh, you know, company A, company B. Company A is linear. Company A buys new raw materials, makes products and sells them. They are trying to make those materials uh, cheaper, but that's hard. You know, some are investing in mines. Many things are happening mm -hmm. within the global economy, and they're making those products more efficiently using less material. Trying to buy time, but actually in the transition to what? And then there are other companies who are becoming more circular, who are valorizing those, those raw materials to a much higher level. They're keeping their products, components, materials at the highest value and utility at all times. They become much more resilient they're much less exposed to those price hikes. I mean, that's as relevant for businesses um, as it is for emerging innovators, as it is for investors. Actually, just thinking about those two different pictures, I think, is very helpful when you look at what, what could happen around the circular economy. Great. Thank you very much. You've got a very constructive intensity about you, and I, I can see why you are so successful in what you do, whatever you do. <laughs> and uh, you've really framed this conference well to kick us off. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you thank very you much. Very much.